Good morning, everyone. I want to invite you to open your New Testament to the book of John, please. John in chapter 10, we're going to read the verses on the screen behind me, verses 7 to 18, by way of introduction here. John 10, 7 to 18. Please follow along. Verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father." Let's pray before we begin our study. Our God and our Father in heaven, as we open up your scriptures, we pray that we would open up our hearts and our minds to the message that you're teaching us. Father, let the meditation of our hearts and the words of our lips be acceptable in your sight during this time of Bible study. Help us to be receivers of this lesson Help us to be doers of your word so that we can be blessed in our doing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Life's too short to drink bad coffee. That's uh, something that Rachel and I learned when we were in Missouri. We didn't have a whole lot, and so we used to uh, do our shopping at this one store. We can get a good, good price on stuff, and we would buy the coffee from that store and it was the worst. It was the worst coffee. So we decided that life's too short to drink bad coffee. We would try to find some room in the budget where we could get something that tasted decent. And I got to thinking about that this week, and I thought, there's a lesson in there somewhere. And there is, and and you're getting it here. Life's too short to drink bad coffee. We could say that about a lot of things, right? Life's too short to drive a boring car. Life's too short to wait in a long line to get whatever, new iPhone. Life's too short not to wait in line, depending on your point of view. Life's too short to hold a grudge. You could say that about any number of things. To put things in perspective. To say this thing is less important than this thing, right? Life's too short to waste time on things that don't matter. You need to live life for all it's worth. And get the most out of it. And the Bible uh, totally agrees with that. When the Bible describes life here on this earth, life under the sun, it describes it as a breath, as a shadow, as a vapor. As Abraham says, we are but dust and ashes. It always describes life under the sun in fleeting terms. It's because it's too short. And Jesus agrees. As we read in our text here, he came... Because life is too short, he came so that we could get a life worth living. The thief comes, see there in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life, not only have life, but have it abundantly. This this world's filled with, with great promises for life. 
Others promise life to protect your life, to enrich your life, to fulfill your life, to prolong your life. But in the end, really all those things do is take life away. And some of these promises, they exploit your life. And in any sign of danger, those promises will fade away. And they won't save us. But Jesus came not just to give us life, but to give us an abundant life, the best life. And the word abundance there in verse 10 is not just more life in the sense of, you know, quantity. He doesn't use the word everlasting life there. That's a different word, even though that that's, that's true, that we have everlasting life in Jesus. But more life, abundant life, more life in the sense of quality, more in substance, a superior kind of life is what Jesus wants to give us. Life of the fullest measure, the very best life. And so what makes the life that Jesus gives the very best? I want to look at three things, three basic truths about the life that Jesus gives together. Let's look at this first one in the most basic sense. Jesus is the source of all life in the universe. If it weren't for Jesus, none of us would be here. And I don't mean like here at the church building, you know, worshiping God because we're Christians. I mean, we wouldn't be here at all. We wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't be thinking, breathing entities, living beings. All of life, the Bible teaches, comes through Jesus, comes from Jesus. And that's why we don't just honor Jesus. We don't just respect Jesus as this moral, ethical teacher. We worship Him. We praise Him. We devote our lives to Him. This is how John introduces us. He chooses to introduce us to Jesus as the divine, eternal agent of creation that was there in the beginning. He describes Him as the Word. John 1, verses 1 through 4, In the beginning was the Word, referring to Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. This is how Paul puts it when he writes to the Colossians. See, speaking of Jesus, he says, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So as we're on Netflix, we're watching this wonderful nature documentary, and you're seeing, you know, life, you know, under a microscope and life through a telescope. That's all because of the power of, of, of the Lord Jesus. That's all because Jesus is, is able by His power to hold it all together. He's that powerful because He's the source of all life. All life, all biologic life, all cosmic life comes from Him. And all of our life comes from Him too, our physical life. You woke up today because you received life from Jesus. Your spiritual life, your emotional life, your relational life, it all flows from Him. And therefore, to know Him is not only to know who you've come from, which is an important question to answer, but who to live for. It's all about Jesus. You're all about Jesus. You were created through Jesus, and you were created for Jesus. This is how Jesus himself puts it in this beautiful prayer to the Father. He prays in John 17, 3, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Life, that, that, that may seem like a, a very basic point to make, but life's too short to miss that basic point. And eternity is too long to find out too late that it's true. Because if Christ is the source of all life, then to refuse Him, to neglect Him, to stop our ears to His words, 
to cover our eyes to his life in Scripture. To choose not to know Jesus is essentially to refuse life itself. And to choose death instead. This is how John puts it, not in his gospel, but in his letter. And this is the testimony. In other words, this is what I'm trying to, the message I'm trying to get across to you, what we witness. This is it. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Do you have the Son? If you do, then you have the life. Jesus is the best life for us because he's the source of all of life in the universe, life that's eternal, life that's full, life that's good, life that's abundant, the life that matters. And until we really wrap our minds around that and accept that and understand that, then all of our life will be incomplete. Our life will be purposeless. Our life will lack real substance because we all intuitively know that life is important and life has to mean something. And so we search for meaning in life. We seek to fill that strange void. What's it all about? How can I find fulfillment and, and, and purpose? What's the goal of this whole thing? And we search through the world and what the world and what our life under the sun is offering to us. And maybe it's in a relationship and we're on the right track there. And maybe it's through marriage and finding a marriage partner. And maybe God blesses you to find one. And you find one who, who truly loves you, a husband or, or, or a wife. And you find great meaning and great purpose in that, but still you're left feeling empty. And so maybe it's through children. And you find the value and, and, the, and the love of, of raising children, but still you're left feeling like there's still something missing. And so you can go through all the avenues and the corridors of life, you know, go down the career path. I'm going to, to, to you know, try to run up the, the, the corporate ladder and see how high I can get, see how much money I can make, see what degrees I can get. And all of these things we attain, we can still feel empty and thirsty. Our souls are thirsting. It's only through knowing Christ, the source of all life, that we can have this abundant life that Jesus is promising in John 10, in verse 10. But in order to show us what the fullness of life, this abundant life really is, Jesus shared our life on the earth. He's the source of all life in the universe, but he shared our life on the earth. This is another foundational yet challenging truth of Christianity. And it's a bit of a paradox of who Jesus is and always will be and what Jesus became. Jesus became the eternal Jesus who is the source of all life in the universe. He became something he was not. Look at how John, if you skip down to verse 14 of his gospel, says about this word, the word became flesh. He became a human being. He took on a human body and he dwelt. He lived right here among us. So the eternal literally steps into time. The artist of the cosmos becomes a stroke of paint on his own canvas. The potter becomes clay on his own wheel. What would that journey from heaven to earth look like? What would that feel like to experience? It's one of the difficulties of, of, of Christianity is just trying to imagine that, but it's the truth. The source of all life chose to bind himself to human life with all of its limitations. The source of all light chose to enter the darkness of his mother's womb and then to see the very light that he created through the unfocused eyes of a newborn. Have you ever thought about that? The Word of God. The Word of God. Therefore, the, the, the God, of the, the source of all language and communication had to learn to formulate words and sentences and manipulate his tongue and his lips as he learned language from his earthly parents. He who never knew hunger, he who never knew fatigue, he who never knew weakness was made to eat and to rest and to sleep. He chose to be subject to all of these limitations. He partook of the same things 
that we partake of. He came to share our life in its fullness, all of what that means to be human. Jesus came to share that with you from the womb all the way to the tomb, from birth all the way to death, in order to show us how to do it right. It's as if Jesus is saying in the Gospels, this is how to be a human being. You've never seen this before. Even way back in the garden, you've never seen this before. This is how to live as a human. And it just We don't have time to look at these things in detail, but you can read some of these scriptures in your own time. But Jesus' life, it wasn't easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it was the abundant life. It was the most free life. It was the best life. He modeled what life is all about. Jesus taught us that abundant life puts relationships above things. Why is it so hard for us to learn that lesson? Life is about putting relationships before things. He even said one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he modeled that. He showed us what that means. He didn't possess much in the way of material things on this earth. He said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But think about all the relationships that Jesus has. He loves and is loved by millions of people. Jesus taught us that the best life puts mercy above sacrifice. To Jesus, a heart of compassion, a heart of mercy, was more valuable than outward religious observance. Not saying that that was unimportant or that that didn't have its place. But he's saying all of the outward things that we do, all of the prayers, all of the sacrifices that we make for God, none of it matters unless we know what mercy is about, unless we have a heart of love for God and our neighbor. He reached out and he touched people that needed connection. He healed people that were sick, physically, yes, but spiritually as well. He did it on the wrong day, too, and he got a lot of flack for that, right, on the Sabbath day. And he would tell people who were angry with him for healing people on the Sabbath, who were trying to, to, to paint him as, 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 as a bad character. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He befriended people that others rejected. He reached out and loved people that the world thought was unlovable. He put mercy above sacrifice. He teaches us that the abundant life is about service. It's about putting service above status. We're blinded by the world, and the world is telling us, no, no, it's about status. It's about power, but not Jesus. He was greater. He was more powerful he was more wise, he was stronger than other people, and yet how did Jesus live his life? Well, he led by being the greatest servant to have ever lived. And he disproved that myth that it's about status and power and, and wealth and position. Those aren't the way to a fulfilled life. The true way to be human is the way of humility. And Jesus himself modeled that. And Paul, in the beautiful poem in Philippians 2, talks about that, how Jesus, you know, he did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he poured out himself. He took on the form of a servant, became a human being, and he served all the way, even to a shameful death on the cross. Humility. And then glory. He was resurrected. He paved that way for us. That's what life is about. He taught us that the best life puts giving above getting. Giving above getting. Jesus showed us that, that generosity and, and love, they produce life. Whereas greed and covetousness and envy, they just produce death. And Paul writing about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he told the Corinthians who were struggling in this, developing this Christ-like mindset of being generous, he told them in verse 9, for you know the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And so Paul said in Acts 20, quoting the Lord, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Who modeled that better than Jesus, right? Who gave everything for us, who became poor so that others might become rich. 
Jesus taught us the best life puts forgiveness above vengeance. He was wronged. He was wronged by so many people. He was sinned against. He was blasphemed. He was hit. He was spit upon. He was rejected. He suffered, and all of it he suffered innocently. And yet, he not only lived without bearing a grudge against the people who hated him, he sacrificially died loving those very people who killed him. One of the most beautiful statements in all the Bible is the statement, one of the statements of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. And he looks out upon this crowd of people, the very people who, who drove the nails in his body, the very people who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And he simply said a, a one-sentence prayer, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. That's what life is about. Even Jesus, condemned to die on the cross, was free, was more alive than anyone who was at his feet. He taught us the best life puts God and others before self. The abundant life is not about having more, more of this, more of that, quantity. Now, Jesus had very little, but he taught a life lived for God, who puts God first, no matter the cost, is to have everything worth having. And a life lived for self and for, for personal gain, even if we gain the whole world but lose our soul in the process, would be a complete disaster. So the best life, this life modeled by Jesus is a life that's wholly centered on living for God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. He modeled that. Like what Moses said way back when in the book of Deuteronomy, as God's people were just about ready to cross the Jordan River and inherit the, the promised land, he said, See, I have set life and death before you, therefore choose life. Jesus did that every step of the way. He chose life, and he lived abundantly. And you might, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Jesus is the source of all life in the universe. And wow, you know, Jesus modeled that life. And yes, absolutely, we need to follow that. But that might actually leave us feeling a, a little bit inadequate. I, I've tried to live that way. I can't live that way. Sometimes I live that way, but I don't live that way every day. I don't make all of those choices all the time. And that's why this last point is the most important point of all. That Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross. We don't always live like Jesus. In fact, left to ourselves, we make such a mess of our lives that our lives on earth are often marked by a bunch of little deaths along the way. We experience these little deaths, the little death of feeling hopeless, the little death of, of, of living in fear. You're alive, but you're in slavery. The little death of, of feeling lost, of feeling like you, you don't have any purpose. The little death of boredom, the little death of bitterness, the little death of hatred, the little death of broken relationships. As we look through our past and we see, ah, oh, I've made such a mess because I chose death. Instead of life, I just keep going back to this verse uh, over the last several weeks in Mark 6 when Jesus sees this great crowd and he has compassion on them. And Mark points out to us he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looked out on, on all these thousands of people that have come to follow him and his heart just broke for these people. They were just living aimlessly. They were just sort of wandering around in life. They had no guidance. They had no real spiritual protection. Nobody was reaching out to them and, and, and loving them with giving them healing and forgiveness. They were just sheep, just wandering around the hillside, tripping in ditches, breaking their legs, getting lost. Sheep without a shepherd. That's what life is like without Jesus. There's no direction. There's no purpose. There's no protection. I'm reminded of something that um, Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 34. God is, is rebuking the shepherds of 
of uh, Ezekiel's day. And how these shepherds were terrible shepherds. They were really good at looking out for themselves, but not for the sheep. It, it talks about these shepherds in chapter 34 of Ezekiel. They, uh, they were making sure that they were feeding themselves, and they were nice and fat and well-fed, but they didn't feed the sheep. Uh, verse 4 talks about the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you haven't sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Well, those are all the shepherds of the world, aren't they? They promise life, but they only come to steal and kill and destroy. They're out for themselves, and the moment the wolf comes, they're nowhere to be seen. Not Jesus. In this passage, God promises, I will be a shepherd to them. I will go and find the lost. I will, will, will bind up those who are broken. I will, will restore those who are lost. Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the kind of shepherd I am. When the wolf comes, I'll protect you. I'll even give my very life for you. And this is what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It was the Father's love and the Son's love working together in harmony, and we see that most clearly when Jesus dies, of course, on the cross. And so the abundant life, the life that Jesus is offering, it comes through the death of Christ. Jesus took the cost and the consequences of our sins, which the Bible tells us is death, is separation from God. He took those upon himself as he died on the cross so that we could live his abundant life. So he's not just an example of how to live life. No, he dies as a sacrifice so that we can live an abundant life. So Peter says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Another thing about this eternal life, this abundant life, it's not just something that Christians get one day after they die, some sort of vague future promise. One day we'll have this. Now, this is, according to Jesus, this is a present reality for all who reach out in faith and cling to Him, for all who believe and obey the gospel, that you can be alive today. Look at what Jesus says in the Gospel of John in chapter 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. Has. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And so this eternal life can be living within us now, today, if we want it to, and working in our lives. Now, today, and forever. Why? For as the Father has life in Himself, so He's granted the Son also to have life in Himself, and He can give us that life. Well, how do we get it? Well, the best life comes through Christ living within us. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh or in this body on this earth, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is he saying? I'm not the one calling the shots anymore. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm not going to rely upon my own wisdom anymore. I'm going to allow Jesus to take control. I'm going to listen to Him, and I'm going to make His priorities my priorities. His standards will become my standards. His ethics will become my ethics, so that His will can be lived out in my life. Paul wanted to be a channel of God's love and mercy, an extension of God's will. And this is the kind of imagery you have in the Bible of Jesus being the head and the church and all the people who are part of Jesus being the body to carry out His will. Those are the people living their best life. You see those stupid hashtags, living my best life, and it's just a person showing their abs or like eating avocado toast or something like that. No, living your best life is being a Christian. And it doesn't look like much to the world, but it's being a Christian. It's following Jesus. How can we access that life? 
And how can I be absolutely certain that Christ is living within me? Well, he gave us a hint right here. I have been crucified with Christ. Well, before life, there must be death. And that sounds a bit backwards, right? We think maybe death comes after life, but not with Jesus. Before life, there has to be death. Before we can live with Jesus and Jesus can take up residence and dwell within us and live within us, there has to be a certain kind of death in our lives where we die to ourselves and we die to this world. There has to be a moment of change in our hearts and in our minds. There has to be a moment of turning when faith reaches out to grasp that eternal abundant life in Jesus and to invite Him in to our life. And how do I do that? It's not through just saying a, a, a prayer and, and asking Jesus to come into your life. You don't, never see that really in, in the Bible. No, we signify that ending and that new beginning with a symbol, with a symbolic death and resurrection that joins us with Jesus and points forward to our future death and resurrection. And Paul talks about this in many places, but we'll just pick one verse here, Romans 6 and verse 4. He's writing to Romans who have already been baptized in this way, and he says, We were buried, therefore, with him, with Jesus, by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so baptism is an immersion. It's, it's a, a leaving one world and entering a whole new world. It's leaving uh, the world where Jerome is the one who's calling the shots and he's going to be living by his wisdom and I take priority and I'm going to live for myself and do whatever I want. And it's saying no to all of that and it's saying yes to Jesus. You lead me, you guide me, you direct me. It's crucifying self so that J Jesus is freed up to live in our lives. And that happens because we're immersed into his death so that we can be immersed into his life. And in baptism then, we're cleansed. We're cleansed inwardly by Jesus' death. And we're filled inwardly with Jesus' life. And the best life, yes, it can begin here and now, but it will one day be culminated and finally realized, fully realized, in the resurrection. And that is the Christian's hope. As Jesus said to a grieving friend who just lost her brother, he spoke these beautiful words of hope, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever uh, everyone who, who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he puts the question to her. That's the truth. Now, do you believe it? Do you believe it? So life's too short for a lot of things. But it's not too short to do this most important thing. I, I always love the image. This is one verse I knew about even when I was a kid. And it was mainly because... My mom had like a, like a painting of Jesus knocking on a door. I always thought that was interesting. I thought, where did that come from? Well, here it is. It's, it's in the Bible. And Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him and he with me. You know, the question is, are, are you going to let Jesus into your life? And you know, allowing Jesus to come in means, yes, allowing him to come in. There's a lot of good things in our life, and there's a lot of terrible things in our life, and there's some choices that maybe we're proud of, and then there's some choices that we're really ashamed of. But it's essentially just asking Jesus in faith. And you can do this by repenting of your sins today, and you can do this if you've never been baptized before by being baptized today. And just saying, Jesus, come in and sort out this mess. And by his death, he will cleanse you inwardly. And by his life, he will fill you inwardly. And you can live that abundant life. And watch how Jesus will shape you as he lives within you into the person that you were always meant to be. 
I'd like for you, us to pray together uh, now as we end our lesson. Our Father in heaven, as we close the scriptures uh, for this moment, our hearts are open to your word. And there are many people here today and many people who are listening today. And we all, Father, together want Jesus to come in, come into our hearts, and to sort out our lives. And it's never too late to do this, Father. It's never too late because your gospel tells us that you're a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And as long as we have life, we're so grateful that you will give us that abundant life if we repent and as we read from the scriptures, if we're baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, that Jesus can come and live within us and that we can have that abundant life here today. We pray, Father, if, if we've already done that, that Jesus might have his way in our life and that we can be reflections of his will. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.